is up you guys welcome back to my youtube channel oh god today we're going to talk about childhood trauma i think i've been prolonging this video because truly it's like when you want to just keep things in the past and you don't want to talk about it I think it's part of the process of like not wanting to relive that scene. I struggle with CPTSD. So whenever I talk about things, it's an imagery to me. Like I have to remember the replay of what happened in my childhood. And that is, that is scary. Okay, because who wants to remember all the bad things that happened to them as a child? Not me okay and as an air sign i just love to avoid those topics um so childhood trauma i used to think that childhood trauma for me it would be just jokes like i would always make a way to like just joke about how serious my trauma was because that was the only way I could process it without really feeling how bad it really was. And when I mean bad, I am talking about, it wasn't just like, oh, you know, I got spanked. I didn't get spanked, I got beat. Okay, I got traumatized. <sighs> so, growing up, my mother was schizophrenic. Still, it's, she still is schizophrenic. Um, I no longer talk to her and that is because it is not good for my health, my mental health specifically. I don't think I'm ready to face her because I have to be okay with who she is. I have to be in a place where I know she has a mental illness and I can't control that. So I'm there. I just don't want ac I don't want her to have access to me for my own for my own sake, you know. I love her, I do, I have a, a genuine love for her, but I know that she triggers a lot, a lot of unhealed trauma inside me. And just the, just seeing her just triggers me a lot. Hearing her voice is very triggering um, because she was a big part of my childhood trauma. My abuse, my neglect, the abandonment wound, why I struggled with my own self-worth, self-love for so many years. It was because of what I had to deal with. And how I was unable to process because I was never taught about emotional maturity or stability or how to navigate my emotions. I was never taught that. So growing up with a mother who was not only schizophrenic, but she had a learning disability and she also was bipolar. So, that anger and that resentment that she had towards me was majority because my father left her and she blamed me for a long time for my father leaving her. My own father was a drug addict and uh, he also was messing with gangs and stuff like that in Mexico. So it's like, I had two very, two very opposites, like victim and then the narcissist. She was a narcissist too, but she was like a victim narcissist. And then he was like the, I control, you know, anger. He, he was mostly bipolar anger. I want to control the situation, but whatever he was, both of them had very bad mental health issues. He, he had no filter. He's definitely you know people before so I had to grow up at a very young age really fast and it started when my dad had left I was five my father beat my mom in front of me I think I was five or six around that age it's my my memory is very blurry but I was five or six when my father not only left but he got deported because they had a big fight that day. I remember that day like it was yesterday. I really do because that's what CPTSD does is they have flashbacks and they just feel like it's today. I was on my bed 
my brother was sleeping we had a bunk bed it was a studio apartment we lived on the third floor and in this third floor there was a kitchen you could just walk from the living room into the kitchen like that and there was like a wall blocking the kitchen and the living room and uh there was one window one bathroom and he decided that day that you know he was doing drugs that day he was doing methamphetamines if you guys know what it is he was smoking the pipe out in front i saw him through the window no there was two windows through the window in the living room where the front door is right next door what's right next to the door and the window is right there um and i looked out the window and i was like what is that and he was you could see he was smoking the pipe you know and um i didn't know what it was i was so young you know i was so innocent i didn't know what anything was and then um he put it in his jacket and when my mother got home he left his jacket in the house and i took it out and i showed my mom because i didn't know what it was and i was like why is like papa like you know in spanish we said papa you know papi papa that's how we, we call him usually papa in spanish so um i talked to her and i asked her hey why is papa having this in his pocket and they look like a bunch of little crystals in a baggie right you guys know what that is um I handed it to her and she was like mijo what are you doing with that and i was like it was in papa's jacket and like i was so little i was so innocent and so i gave it to her and i like sat on the bed he came back and that's when the argument started he was high as a kite off of god knows what other drugs he was doing but he was high as a kite and he like slammed her against the wall and he tried to r word her in front of me my brother's sleeping on the bed still and I'm scared. I don't know what's happening. I hear them both yelling. And he's like, she's like, you're gonna do this in front of your daughter, are you serious? And he's trying to take her pants off, like forcefully. And she's screaming, help, call 911. So I get scared. I like run towards the phone on the floor. You know, the phones that were cords and it cord to the wall. And I tried to call 911 and he grabs the phone for me and rips the cord with his mouth and I got scared and I ran under the bunk bed and I hid and she's like please get help scream scream call for the cops or whatever and he's sitting here hitting her punching her and he's like fighting her while I'm still there watching and so I go to the kitchen I ran because this is like he's so he doesn't know what's going on around him his focus is only her like I'm going to hurt her and he's high as a kite and he's like, I want her. Like, he's trying to force himself on her. And um, I scream outside the kitchen window. And I ask for help. I'm screaming. I'm screaming, help, help. My mom needs help. Help, help. My mom's beating my mom. And like, the, you know, by the grace of God, there is cops right across the street where i'm yelling the apartment's right it's a three-story building this was on camelback and 17th Ave. there's a three-story building and at the time there was a fries right there and there was a fries right there There was three cop cars right there waiting and i'm screaming my lungs out and i'm like help help and like the window is open and the cops hear me luckily they hear me right and they see me and i'm like on top of the sink i like climbed on top of the sink i'm screaming for help because my mom's crying and she's asking for help so i'm taking the responsibility as a five or six year old child trying to help my own mother away from this abuse right and i'm screaming i'm screaming i'm screaming finally like I stood and they're like, we're coming. And you could see the cops are coming. They come up the stairs, da 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 They run the stairs, they slam the door open. They like, literally like, they use this like black thing to like smack the door open. And they complete like, they, they took the door off the hinges, right? They grab my dad, they slam him on the floor. They handcuff him. And that is the last time I saw him. That was the last vision. That's the last version of him that I seen. Was him getting handcuffed and then telling my telling my mother i want a divorce and then she's like good i want a divorce too and then boom gone never seen him again we did talk on the phone for a little bit but that was the last thing i saw yeah so there is my uh version of a father um i was in foster care also it wasn't too long after he had gotten deported 
where the abuse got worse with my mother, where she would beat me and um, she would leave me unattended. I was like six and she would go work because she was working security. And there was a time when CPS came, she had left me and my brother alone for 15 hours. No babysitter in sight. I was six years old. My brother was one and a half. Six years old. My brother was one and a half. Who leaves their children that long by themselves? 15 hours. Macaroni was already made. So she was telling me, hey, here's the mac and cheese. You can eat that while I'm gone. And she left. She said she called a babysitter. Why didn't the babysitter show up when the cops were there? And I, and I just agreed with her because I didn't want to get in trouble, you know? And I remember my brother's crying. I'm making the mac and cheese. He needs his diaper change. I change his diaper. And I'm like, it's okay, it's okay. And he won't stop crying. I give him a bottle. And I'm like, so scared. I'm like, what's going on? Like, why isn't he not stop crying? Like, I know I'm doing what I can because I'm so young. You know what I'm saying? I'm still a baby myself. And then someone's knocking on the door. It's the neighbor. Where's your mom? Where's your mom? They're like, is your mom home? And I was like, yeah, she's sleeping. They're like, can you talk? Can I talk to her? And I said, no, she's sleeping. She's she's not available. <laughs> like, I for real, like, covered up for my own mother. At a very young age, I started hiding for her. Like, I started covering for her at a very young age. And this this went on for years of covering for her. And um, by the time she got home, CPS was called. The cops were called. And um, I got taken away. And that's when my, when the abuse not only led from just her, but the abuse went into the system where I was abused in DCS care from people I didn't even know, from my own family members who took me in. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's bad that it got so bad that the abuse was that like, what child? I couldn't imagine my own child going through something like that because when they took me away from my mother, it's like you could see it in her face. I was like, I don't wanna go. And I was holding onto her legs so tight. I remember just holding onto her legs so tight and just like holding on. I'm like, I don't wanna go. And they're like, she's like, just go. And I said, why? And I'm, she's like, just go. And like, it's like she didn't care. There was like, like, like I was this burden on her chest. And that look on her face, like still like hurts me till this day. Because I could never imagine letting my child go like that. I will fight for whatever I have to fight for. I would do whatever I have to do. And then to find out that she did not want to fight for us. So her friend made her fight for us to get me and my little brother back. This is before my other two younger siblings were born. And forced her to fight for us because she didn't want us no more. It was too much work for her. Now, we're going to end this video because this is like at 15 minutes. I'm getting really emotional. So I'm going to need to like go back. But this is... This is going to be part one. We're going to go through my life. I'm still at this this age. I'm still six. I'm six. I'm six or seven. Um, and I just got brought into the system. So when I come back to part two, we will finish this. But I already have a lot of emotions coming up. So let me let me process that. I love you guys. Um, this is going to be a long journey. Talking about my trauma is scary it's vulnerable but i want to be vulnerable with y'all so i love y'all thank you so much for listening i'll talk to y'all soon and peace mm -hmm.